<laughs> so good evening. Um, I prepared a little presentation I wanted to talk about um, that I've discovered is, is somewhat of a connection between the, um, the, the foundations of the green movement and um, what later became sort of a green economics and um, how, how that transition happened. Um, I'm going to start with a man named Sir Arthur Kingsley. Uh, in 1913, he founded the British Ecological Society, which was a time period where uh, eugenics was popular. Uh, the American movement was the biggest, but uh, it came from Britain. The Huxleys, uh, and Thomas Huxley was the grandfather of eugenics. And, uh, that was, uh, it was not a dirty word at the time. People uh, believed that uh, you know, we need to strengthen the gene pool by eliminating the weaker. Um, at the same time period, um, you had the Sierra Club uh, starting to surface, and they were um, trying to get involved in, in building dams in, in San Francisco, things like that. That was the sort of earliest incarnation you're going to see of the uh, green movement um, with these two things simultaneously emerging, the BES and the Sierra Club. Um, the BES was, was kind of a, a, a vehicle of British imperial rule. Um, and uh, Sir Arthur Tainsley uh, was an interesting character. Craig Isherwood from uh, the, uh, the CEC in Australia, that's uh, a LaRouche organization, he, he uh, did a report about Tamesley uh, saying that he was not an objective scientist. Uh, he was a, a product of Britain's elite Trinity College in Cambridge. Uh, he was a Fabian socialist, a devout eugenicist, and uh, he was also the protege of a man named Bertrand Russell, who uh, LaRouche knows him better than I do, he would tell you that he was the most evil man of the 20th century uh, who once advocated to uh, nuclearly annihilate Russia before they could get the bomb, uh, you know, because that was uh, the best path to world peace, I guess. Maybe, you know, if we just annihilate everyone, then, then we'll be uh, eternally peaceful, right? Uh, so Tainsley's primary idea was that uh, the environment sort of existed in, a, in an equilibrium state where you have um, sort of a stasis of, uh, of these systems that are, that are sort of um, feeding into each other in, in a series of feedback loops. And it's all a closed system, of course. Um, you know, the universe of the closed system is entropic. Uh, there's, there's no way to increase or or refine or um, develop your resources. You just have what you have, and, and uh, it's sort of, you know, everything's like a, a, a clock that's been wound up and is, is winding down and eventually will uh, stop, and you'll have, you know, evenly dispersed, uh, motionless matter, I guess. And I suppose that's the ideal state for the uh, oligarchy. They, you know, change is bad, and Motionlessness is good, I suppose. Um, but this whole worldview is, is incredibly flawed. You can see evidence everywhere you look. You know, life is clearly developing towards higher complexity and not winding down. That's why we have cities and you know language. Um, you can also look at uh, you know the the, the records of um, like fossil records. I'll show you um, a good example is cyanobacteria, which is kind of like a blue-green algae. Uh, 2.4 billion years ago, it started to um, have its own revolution where uh, it, it was using photosynthesis to eat up the, um, the, the CO2 and the, and the certain gases in the atmosphere, and it produced oxygen, and it was so successful at this, actually, that uh, 
you had a, a collapse of all these other species that were that were based on these other gases, and you had the the um, what's it called here? This is the greatest extinction event that we know of. Uh, but but that was actually followed by what's called the Cambrian explosion, which is a huge uh, evolutionary leap where many new species were formed and uh, they all had greater ability to metabolize energy in their environment. They were bigger. They could, you know, move day and night, not just when the sun was out, things like that. Uh, quite a big difference, actually, in, in the, their abilities. They had lungs, you know, their, their breathing air, things like this. They're, they're coming onto the land. So this kind of shows you that, that life is... is um, going in a certain direction. It's not just random, right? And you don't have, um, it's not really a system of stasis, right? It's not, it's not just equilibrium and balance and staying the same. It's changing, it's evolving, it does that on its own. That's how life works. That's how the universe, the universe works. But uh, these guys are, are pushing a reductionist philosophy that sort of frames the natural world as a closed, fixed system, which first works best when change least. Uh, it has very little potential for change, but this doesn't match with, with the world we, you know, have measured from our experience. So, you know, the 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 idea is that. Uh, any changes that we impose through our activity are detrimental to the environment, um, have a negative effect, on and that we're not really possible, capable of, of having a positive uh, effect on the environment or, or our surroundings. Um, it's a zero-sum ideology, so you know it's, it's it's literally that the idea that you can take everything you see, reduce it to an equation of mathematics balance it out on two sides of the equation and, and uh, that's it. There's no there's no way to really change the uh, parameters on either side and um, you've kind of got, uh, you know, it's balanced. So if you change anything, it throws off the balance and, and it all goes out of whack and, and you have a catastrophe, I suppose. So Tainsley called this the great universal law of equilibrium. Um, and they wanted to apply this to everything, uh, including mechanical systems, where you know you can you can show some examples of closed systems where um, these things could, could these theories could work, but you know the reality is that most things you look at, such as the world or the universe or the human mind, they're they're not closed systems, they're they're constantly changing and they're subject to um, self-conscious creative change. Um, they wanted, uh, one of the things that came out of this was the Gaia theory. You know, that's, that's applying this, this idea to, to the world as a, and, and considering it as an organism. Um, so this is the, the, the cybernetics of the 60s. Uh, so if everything can be reduced to equations, including the human mind, and that means that computers can replace all of those things, including the human mind. And, um, of course, that would mean that that's the best way to ensure stability, right? And you've got a uh, centuries-old decaying empire that has a uh, great vested interest in, in stability and, and status quo and making sure that things don't change, right? So you can sort of see the parallel here. You guys hear me okay? Mm -hmm. What? <laughs> so, um, yeah, it just doesn't make sense, though. We, we would have gone extinct if, uh, if, there, if there was no change inherent in our nature. Uh, so you have the stage set for the computer utopianists of California in the 80s. Uh, they sort of believed that um, 
computers can free us from the, from the scourge of leadership uh, and, and big ideas that sort of transcend the current reality. Um, they thought that, you know, power structures and centralization were, were the enemy and that, uh, you know, you can, you can um, be free of these things you know, free to pursue your, your your own pleasures and avoid pain, I suppose, by um, creating a feedback loop or a series of feedback loops of, of um, the human experience. So you set up so that everyone is interconnected through these computers and, and can give feedback about whatever they're experiencing and, and that, you know, some algorithms that that, um, that that read this data and give feedback themselves are going to, to govern society and how you manage the resources and stuff like that. But of course, it's again going to be a fixed state. It can't grow. It can't change. It can't improve. It's just going to be staying with with the you know sticking with the carrying capacity that we have, which the World Wildlife Fund would, would say is a billion people. Some say less. Um, or it also can be true. Speaking of it, doesn't work. Things change. Of course. Yeah. We all have the, the power that Neo has to revolutionize it. So they did this experiment where they put um, 500, 800 people in a stadium, something like that, and they gave them all uh, paddles. One side is red, one side is green. They put them all on, the, on their chair. And um, they didn't give them any instructions. They just people sat down and checked out these paddles and said, "What do these do?" And then someone held one up and saw that it correlated to something on the screen on on the uh, big screen in front of everyone. So pretty soon they all figured out that, that these things actually have an effect on what's happening there, and it's, a, it's sort of a cumulative effect. So once there's two sides of the room. One side controls the, the right side, and the other side controls the left side of the screen. It's actually the game of Pong, which is in, in the 80s when that was the, the latest game. So you would like this. Yeah. You had uh, one side of the room versus the other, and uh, red makes the, the pound go up, and green makes it go down. So if they want to stop it, they want to defend their goal, they actually uh, they can't have everyone turn it red and go up, because then it'll go too fast and go beyond the, the thing, so some of the people had to be pulling it down, even though clearly it has to be moving up. So so they sort of have this balance that... Uh, they but, but just figured it out intuitively? Or? Yeah, just somehow some of them knew that you can't have too many people doing that or go too far, so they found this, this balance where they're actually playing the game and hitting, hitting the ball back and forth, being successful doing this, and they, they claim that this proved that, you know, this whole computer utopian idea would uh, would work, and you don't need leadership, you don't need ideas to, to govern society. You can just have cooperation. You just have a giant game of Pong. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wish that worked. <laughs> it's analogous to it. All right, everyone, time to vote. Turn on your Pong games. <laughs> Pretty much. So it's it's. Uh, an information society that they're going towards, but again, it's, it's not it's not developing. So as the universe is changing, you're not going to really evolve with it, and you know it'll leave you behind if that's if that's the center of your civilization, right? You're going to go extinct. Don't pause after saying something so depressive. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's only if we go with their, their way. I'll, I'll tell you about... Uh, Quickly, tell me something happy. How we can avoid extinction towards the end of this. Um, but yeah, they, they didn't have to think about uh, future generations. Um, you know, if you get this computer thing configured properly, you don't need to worry about anyone else or any other time in the future or, or, or any problems that might face us. You can just concentrate on, on serving your own pleasure, right? You might call it the uh, pursuit of rationalized self-interest, which is a, an Ayn Rand term. I think I heard the term for when I was studying in high school. 
It's called scientific determinism. You, if you knew the exact direction and impact of every particle in the universe, you could predict what would happen from then on over. Mm -hmm. This is theoretically. This is the determinism. Uh, the ideology of determinism, but um, it doesn't quite work. It's pretty dumb. We got this figured out. I know where all the particles are going. What? No. Yeah. No, no. Because there, there's um, things that, that have an effect on, on matter that, that so not we're not matter. Even, it doesn't have a. We're not even seeing. Or we don't have a mass or location, and that's that's ideas. Well, we can't really tell yet whether you, whether like the, the activities of quantum particles can or can't be predicted. That's just what this is what they thought. Yeah, it's it's just what they thought. Yeah. They assumed that. Yeah, you know, well, they said that the uh, the act of um, of, of uh, watching it happen changes the outcome. Yeah. So, we don't know how how exactly that's happening, but uh, there seems to be some effect of the mind that the matrix is not accounted for there. Um. So. They're trying to build this um, this world where uh, you know the carrying capacity of the Earth, uh, you know, it is dictated by what resources we have, and those are fixed, and um, computers should should decide how those resources are, are divvied up, and uh, that leaves all the decision making out of other people's hands, and they can just uh, enjoy themselves, right? And uh, there's actually a, a, a much newer um, project that has come out in the last decade or so. It's become very popular, and uh, it sounds a lot like this. Does anyone uh, know what I'm getting at? SETI? No. no. It's the Venus Project, which is popularized right. in the Zeitgeist films. Um, but yeah, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't have people improving themselves it's just it's just there for you know that that's that's the hook is people think oh if you can just enjoy yourself and leave everything up to the computer. Right. And it's not they're not increasing the 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 means to physically sustain society. Right? It's, it's fixed. I actually interviewed Jacques Fresco myself, I asked him if uh, if you thought the carrying capacity, and, and that's a term that, that, that he uses, uh, which is interesting. I, I'd like to look at the, uh, the etymology of that term, but uh, he said that, that I asked him if the carrying capacity is decided by the population, or if the population is decided by the carrying capacity, and uh, hmm. he basically said that we have fixed resources, and, and uh, you know, there's only, only so many people will be able to say it, but... Decades, you had this uh, cultural demoralization in the 60s with um, the coordinated murders of JFK, RFK, MLK, uh, which led into the Vietnam and Cold Wars. And you had, uh, you know, a culture, a tragic culture, where people didn't see any future because they thought we were all going to be annihilated in a, in a nuclear uh, holocaust. And you know they, they drilled every day for that. You know, hide under your desk. Somehow that'll uh, that'll protect you from from the ten thousand bombs. And uh, and those those three leaders were you know these are people that represented posterity, that represented big ideas, uh, a future of of peace and prosperity, and, uh, and building building things up, development, right? Uh, but those things were crushed, and um, you're left with uh, a culture of people that um, they don't think there will be one, so they, all that's left is, is to just enjoy yourself in the here and now. There's no future to, to consider. There's no, there's no other person. It's just, you know, self-interest. And that's, that's the boomers, uh, for the most part, so that, that 
was sort of the end of the American dream. People are no longer um, working so that their their progeny can have a better existence. They're working for well, they're not working. Yeah. Uh, they, there's no interest in, in uh, creating more potential for the next generation, so that the next generation can get ahead and not be in so much debt, or you know have a have a better chance to develop themselves, get an education, get, get a real profession. Um, they figured, you know, if we don't blow ourselves up, then, then we're going to eat all the resources up and, uh, you know, maybe destroy the environment with some new technology, but one way or the other, there's not really any future to, to work towards. So this this culture kind of made it easy for, for the Ayn Rand type of ideology to become popular, which it did. And she later took on a protege by the name of Alan Greenspan. Although they may have been a little bit more than uh, more than that. Yeah, she called him the Undertaker because he was so cheerful. Yeah. Cheerful, cheerful ideology. So in '87, you have Ronald Reagan he nominates Greenspan as successor to Paul Volcker for chairman of the. Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve. Uh, the idea was that uh, computers could be used to virtually eliminate the risk in the markets by using very complex calculations, which basically are hedging, which is like making side bets to balance the risk of investment. Uh, this created a very large market of financial instruments, um, which continued to grow and is now 20 times the world's product of um, physical product. What, what we produce physically is, is 1 20th of the 1.5 quadrillion dollars of derivatives that are in existence because of this uh, move. Um, and then you had Larry Summers, uh, if anyone wants to look up the end game memo, uh, called the heads of a bunch of banks and uh, worked with them to, to force derivatives into the world trade organizations and now it's a global market and that's how it was able to get so big and then they, they um, made a law that, that these things have an equal value to anything else that you know whatever it says on the paper is, is how much it's worth um, monetarily so um, I guess an insurance bet that that an insurance bet on your house is worth the same as your house, even though it's just a piece of paper. <laughs> um, so it's, again, it's a system that's um, trying to keep this, this equilibrium in balance, but uh, it's sure not, it's careful not to grow physically. It, it just grows monetarily, and they think, they, they pretend that monetary growth is the same as, as physical growth. Uh, but what they really created was a giant casino, uh, which is becoming globalized bit by bit. Uh, the chips in this casino are the derivatives. And um, basically, the, the idea behind them is uh, I don't know if you guys have ever uh, talked to someone who thought that they, they uh, had a good system for perhaps we went to a casino. Uh, I had a friend that, that told me that uh, his idea was, okay, you know, I'll start off with a $5 bet. If that loses, I'll bet 10. If that loses, I'll bet 20, right? And to make so, it up. Yeah, to keep making so it up. eventually you're, you're betting your house so that you can end up with a $5 profit at the end of the day, right? That's called but, chasing. Yeah. yeah. Okay, but the moon. Chasing, uh, <laughs> but, but if you're able to... At some point, I'm going to win. <laughs> <laughs> what yeah. idea. But if you're able to continually pump out new financial instruments, and you can keep this thing going indefinitely, and then, you know, they're not making one bet at a time either. It's, it's millions of bets at a time. And um, you're, you're basically blowing up a huge bubble. It's, it's, they're saying it's making things less risky and more stable, but it's just pushing it off to a later date, consolidating the risk, and making it global, really. And uh, with all this growth of this, uh, this shadow economy, really, 
there's no real growth to go along with it. So it's devaluing and, and endangering the real assets that it's associating itself with. This is why you need Glass Steagall, because um, they need to be separated. You can't have uh, all these fraudulent, um, worthless debts commingled with real assets like pensions and uh, you know people's bank accounts, farms, and things like that. Because when those become, when it becomes known that those are worthless and fraudulent, then uh, when they go down, they take the, the real economy down with them. And that's when they start asking for a shared sacrifice while wearing a million dollar crown, and, you know, telling us that uh, our nation or our city is bankrupt when it's really they who have bankrupted themselves financially and morally trying to take us down with them or, or uh, sacrifice us to, to keep their game going a bit longer. And actually, um, that's sort of how it works. They just you know, they know they're bankrupt, but as long as they can create some more bets, and those bets are in action, you know, the, the horses are still running, right? You're not bankrupt until it, until it finished running, so. What were the good items besides the farms? Did you say pensions? Or? Yeah, pensions, bank accounts, oh. social services, infrastructure, power plants, bridges, all that good stuff. So that's the real economy, which needs to be saved protected against this other stuff, which devalues it. You know, it's called the firewall, so these, these things um, become known to be uh, worthless. It's like they're on fire. You no know, one wants to, to be holding these types of assets. And anyone who does, you know, everything else that they're holding is going to burn down with it. Because yes. if one, one can't be paid off, then that means the next one can't be paid off. That was the purpose of the writers of these derivatives, was to see it go down. They had sold short, yeah. so they would make a lot of money as the value of these bundles of mortgages would go lower and lower and dying. Yeah, they create these bubbles and, and they bet against their own uh, investors because they know better. And, uh, and the taxpayers were there in the end to pick it up after the bank would fail. Yeah, they know they can't really lose because they, they've got the backstop of uh, leaving us dry to pay for it all. So everything became monetized, you know. Every, everything needs to be sold to uh, to to get uh, more chips in the game. So you got to privatize your, your PC rail and your water and your resorts and wherever else you've got to get money because money has become the end all be all. It's not about, you know, growing or or uh, sustaining life. It's just, just about getting more money. Do you have something? No. Okay. So of course oh, I yeah. don't know. Can I say it? Yeah. I just remembered when you were commenting a couple of minutes ago, um, that uh, uh, they're trying to convince us now that our dollar this pet peeve of mine has gone down 10 or 11 percent from parity. Well, you're too young. But in 1994, and many, many, many years, we were paying 50 percent uh, conversion rates to the U.S. dollar. And they told us then, this is good. It brings in, you know, this is good because this way we entice more more manufacturing and more development and all that. Well, it never happened. And now they're trying to set us on that that slope. I mean, our, our buying power is down 10% in, in, in the period of a couple of weeks. And we don't know what that's going to do. Well, it's all arbitrary anyways, isn't it? I mean, we didn't actually... Yeah, <laughs> that's a good reason to, to drive your MLA or MD crazy because it's, it's, I find it just absolutely shocking. And nothing and material seems to have transpired in the past year or two years in terms of what funds money. Yeah, well, um, our, our concept of value has completely shifted because of this. Um, you know, things that have real value, they might not have monetary value, and things that have monetary value might not, you know, vice versa. 
So these guys, you know, they, they, they put uh, they put the monetary aggregates above all else. That that has to be, uh, you know, for corporations or whatever. They they basically say, you know, screw the environment, screw our future, screw the people. Yeah. We gotta we gotta improve our bottom line every quarter, right? Yeah. And that's actually. Uh, and being a major difference between corporations and government in, in you know, when you're talking about um, the idea of these, of these institutions is, is one exists just to bring profit to the shareholders, and that's, that's their main goal, that's their stated goal. But a government should, should be there to actually, you know, improve the general welfare, be there for human progress, uh, you know, to, to protect us from... Uh, of imperial threats, yeah. things like that, it has a bigger purpose. It's, you know, if the government takes a loss, but, you know, our lives are improved, we get an education, and in the long, in the long run, that's going to be a good investment, but yeah. monetarily, it, it doesn't look like it, right? Yeah, there's no song the dance they can do to convince me of that. Yeah, <laughs> Beneficial cooperation between nations, and that 
that that's the basis for a system that doesn't involve any sort of empire. You don't need an empire if you have um, a world of, of nation states based on uh, Plato's Republic, where they grow by internal development instead of uh, an imperial system that you have today, which grows by conquest, grows ex by external means. So that's, that's the main difference in the two systems. Um, and I'm going to read a quote at some point from Henry C. Carey, um, which I think illustrates it very nicely. Uh, it's just coming up. But, um, so you have uh, the IMF doing their, their loan charting to vulnerable, vulnerable nations. You know, that, uh, and the IMF profits greatly by uh, creating a system of debt slavery where these loans are, are offered out um, when nations are at their most vulnerable and um, the conditionalities that come with that make sure that they can't be repaid completely. So they're always going to be in debt and uh, they're not going to be able to develop their way out of these things. They're going to be stuck doing cash cropping, things like cotton and sugar. Um, you know, single monocrops that, that uh, you know, it, it's not going to be enough to, to sustain your population without having to um, import uh, some of the other things that you need. And, uh, and usually those, even, even those crops that they're that they're producing themselves are not for them, but they're for export. I mean, when there's a famine, they, they force the export, which you can see in, uh, in the, the potato famines in Ireland, which cut the population in half, or more, more, more than that. Yeah. More. That's a conservative estimate, yeah. And then they have to privatize and monetize all the resources, impose austerity on the people, divert funds from the real economy to the uh, Worst coppers. Um, that that's that's the oligarchical principle, and then they tell us, you know, we need a we need zero growth. That's the uh, that's the that's the way to prevent a Malthusian catastrophe is is uh, to you know above all else uh, restrict growth, uh, and that that keeps the, the false scarcity going artificially. Uh, I, I like to, to liken it to, to a boa constrictor because um, what, is, what does a boa constrictor do? Is it, it, uh, it forces you to contract or constrict and it just tightens the noose. So every time, you know, that, that's, that's how it would work in a, in a zero growth economy. There's only two options left. If there's, if there's zero growth, then there's, there's stasis and then there's constriction of your economy. So. Who's proposing zero growth? Well, that, that's the green ideology, right? The green ideology. You'll see the, the WWF. Yes. And, um, the economy has to grow what the magnitude of population increase. So that, that's correct. Yeah. But they don't want a population increase. They want to decrease the population, right? right? And that's the bow constrictor. It's, it's, uh, it's preying on you know, the population. And as it shrinks, you know, it gets happier and gets closer to its meal, right? So that, that's the whole thing, is, is I'm, I'm tying in the, the green ideology with the, um, the monetarism, British monetarism, and, uh, and you know, the setting up of the derivatives um, as, as the central focus of, of world economies. Uh, so what we can do instead is revive the spirit of the American Revolution bring back the credit system that was founded um, by Alexander Hamilton in the time around 1776. Um, the system is, is, is neither capitalism nor, nor communism, which uh, generally people believe is, is the dichotomy, but it's a false dichotomy. Um, the real struggle for dominance is between um, the American system, which is one of internal development and growth, versus the the free trade British imperialist system, which is based on conquest. And so, really briefly, uh, Alexander Hamilton, the first Treasury Secretary of the United States, uh, he created the protectionist system of uh, using tariffs to protect 
the important the things that are actually important to, to sustaining a uh, thriving nation, which are agriculture to make sure everyone's fed, um, manufacturing to turn the to add value to the resources, and turn turn them into you know something more useful. I said for shipping out raw raw logs and raw oil and things like that, you actually turn them into finished products, upgrade them yourself. And uh, in that way, you're creating wealth. You're, you're increasing your means to have a population. And uh, he also put a, a major focus on um, technological development. Uh, there were grants offered for, for people who innovated new ideas. And uh, he called it increasing the productive powers of labor. So basically increasing the efficiency of, of people's labor, which then frees up their time to, to do things, not, not necessarily just things that, that they enjoy, but more specifically things that um, were creative, things that improve themselves and improve the culture for, for the next generation. So, um, 1851, you have Henry C. Carey, he's the, um, the chief economic advisor to Abraham Lincoln. And I think he wrote the most powerful quote to date uh, in reference to the American system, which I would like to read because it's one of my favorite quotes. It's a bit lengthy, but if I, uh, if I don't stumble, you'll, you'll probably be uh, engaged. So, two systems are before the world. The one looks to increase the proportion of persons and of capital engaged in trade and transportation, and theretofore diminish, therefore diminishing the proportion engaged in producing commodities with which to trade, with necessarily diminished return to the labor of all, while the other looks to increase the proportion engaged in the work of production and diminishing that engaged in trade and transportation with increased return to all, giving the laborer good wages and to the owner of capital good profits. One looks to increase the quantity of raw materials to be exported and diminishing the inducements to the import of men, thus impoverishing both farmer and planter by throwing on them the burden of freight, while the other looks to increasing the import of men and diminishing the export of raw materials, thereby enriching both planter and farmer by relieving them from the payment of freight. freight. One looks to compelling the farmers and planters of the Union to continue their contributions for the, me, their contributions for the support of the fleets and armies, the paupers and nobles, the sovereigns of Europe. The other, enabling ourselves to apply the same means to the moral and intellectual improvements of sovereigns of America. One looks to the continuance of that bastard freedom of trade, which denies the principle of protection, yet doles it out as revenue duties. The other, extending the area of legitimate free trade by the establishment of perfect protection, followed by the annexation of individuals and communities, and ultimately by the abolition of custom houses. One looks to exporting men to occupy desert tracts. Sound familiar? The sovereignty of which is obtained by aid of diplomacy of war or war. The other to increasing the value of an immense extent of vacant land by importing men by the millions for their occupation. One looks to increasing the necessity for commerce, the other to increasing the power to maintain it. Uh, I'm not sure if this is the right this word is a misquote. One looks to the underworking of the Hindu and sinking the rest of the world to his level, the other to raising the standard of man throughout the world to our level. One looks to pauperism, ignorance, depopulation, and barbarism, the other in increasing wealth, comfort, intelligence, combination of action, and civilization. One looks towards universal war, the other towards universal peace. One is the English, English system, and the other we can be proud to call the American system. For it is the only one ever devised, the tendency of which was that of elevating, of elevating while equalizing the condition of man throughout the world. 
Such is the true mission of the people of these United States. To raise the, la the value of labor throughout the world, we need only to raise the value of our own. To improve the political condition of man throughout the world, it is that we ourselves should remain at peace, avoid taxation for maintenance of fleets and armies, and become rich and prosperous. <coughs> to diffuse intelligence and to promote the cause of morality throughout the world, we are required only to pursue the course that shall diffuse education throughout the world and shall enable every man more readily to acquire property and with it respect for the rights of property. To substitute true Christianity for the detestable system known as the Malthusian, it is needed that we prove to the world that it is population that makes the food come from rich soils and food tends to increase more rapidly than population thus vindicating the policy of God to man. So, the credit system in question uh, is modeled on the Massachusetts Bay Colony system, and uh, the system that made credit available to anyone that was willing and able to turn an idea into reality, so long as it was a productive enterprise. Yeah. Pretty soon we learned. Yeah, not much longer. So, for instance, if you had a, a poor farmer and uh, you also had a need for food in, in the society, uh, you, can, you can extend federal credit to them at 0 to 1% interest um, get, get them farming, whereas otherwise you have idle money and idle people. It doesn't make sense, right? Um, or if it's not idle money, it's it's newly created credit. But you know, the, the credit can be um, justified by the increase in wealth, which gives it values, which means it's not inflationary. Uh, so in this kind of a system, it, it's not geared towards keeping the rich rich, but the poor can you know have good ideas and, and good work ethic, they, they can elevate their, uh, their state and uh, improve their plight. So this creates a society that, that's focused on scientific and intellectual progress and uh, the general welfare. And uh, so what we need to do is is create a revolution in the hearts and minds of the policymakers uh, to change government from, from existing solely to, uh, to exploit its people to, to benefit the few. Uh, instead, it can, it can exist to, uh, you know, for the general welfare and for the development of uh, the minds, the culture, the science, and all that. Uh, I've got a short quote from Alexander Hamilton himself, this is my favorite of his, uh, a fundamental maxim in the system of public credit of the United States is that the creation of debt should always be accompanied by the means of its extinguishment. So whatever um, you create the credit for um, is not arbitrary, it's not so you can go get a TV or something, it's, it's actually specifically for the purpose of um, Increasing the amount of wealth that there is in existence, right? Bring, bring into new, uh, bringing into existence new wealth. I don't quite follow that. You, you said that is not important. But the, the money is important. Well, it's, it's not. It's not money. It's, we're not talking about monitors and its credit because right. you're not, they're not just giving it out and saying, "Go do whatever you want with it." They're saying. We're creating this for the specific purpose of you going and building that bridge, or going and starting a farm, sure. right? And it's fraud if you don't. And all oh, okay. it, 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 the, the credit will be canceled. These are bills of credit. It's very conditional. They're not, essentially. they're not universal bill, you know, dollar bills that they can just go and spend it somewhere else. It has to be for that. But there would still be credit that would be in circulation for the purposes of regular commerce, right? Sure. And if and if you want to. Use it for speculation. You can you can get uh, a loan for that, but it's not going to be at zero interest. It's going to be a, you know you're going to pay interest on that, and that 
interest instead of going into a billionaire's pocket because we start to be related to the economy, right? And, and it's, not, uh, it's not the, it's not the, the loss won't be to the system itself. So. Yeah, well, it'll be a gain. Be, there'll be yeah. a gain on, in one way. And, yeah. Uh, hopefully it's not too damaging for uh, speculation. Is not too damaging. You, you raised an important point because what would happen if somebody were buying a house and they were given the hundred thousand dollars to make the purchase, but they decided that they're going to use it now for speculation in the market, not actually for the house that was just to come on to qualify for a loan. Exactly. Do, do the bankers have any recourse against someone like that? If it's a bill of credit, yeah. And it, it said right on it what it was for. Right? In today's world, you know, without that system in place, what protection would the bank's got if somebody falsifies the purpose of their loan? Well, you know, fraud is fraud. Um, I'm not would sure. that be a fraud? Uh, that's a good question. That's actually an issue. There's ways around it. You can always you can always engage in some other form of fraud where you use that. Well, it's kind of like being a given you know a McDonald's coupon. You say okay, you can go and use this for specifically buying a McDonald's burger, but there's nothing stopping you from going and selling that coupon to someone and turning it into some other form of credit or yeah, well, just value that you can theft. Yeah, if you don't buy the house and you disappear, how well, are they going to first of all? Hold on, hold on. The, a bank isn't going to give you the loan unless they have the house of security. Okay, that, that, that's, that's, that's what I'm looking for. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. I'm just wondering. No, they're just not no. going to do that. I, no bank is going to give you anything unless, <laughs> unless sure. it's something to secure it. Okay. And what you've been seeing a lot of uh, recently, I think they just had to make a law about this, was people getting cash back with their, with their housing purchase. Right. And then they go do whatever with that, and then they wind up broke because it wasn't, uh, you know, very... Uh, fiscally prudent uh, move when they bought the sports car with their extra money and then can't pay yeah, the, the bill. But, um, but yeah, like Paul was saying, with the securitization, in a monetary system, your your assets are, are what securitizes the loan. And if you don't, uh, if you don't pay it back, you know, you, you get the money to do with whatever you want, go buy a TV, but if you don't pay the you don't pay the loan back, you lose your house, right? In a credit yeah. system, it's not, it's not, that's not how it works. You don't have to be wealthy in the first place to get the loan. The loan is based on what's going to happen in the future, right? It's, right. it's future motivated activity. And if you don't follow through, if, if you're not successful on what they invested in you to do, you just don't have that farm, right? Yes. And so you're just as poor as you were before. And, uh, but there's there's very little reason not to, right? Because you can't you can't go and spend it at the casino. Oh, it, it was a it was a bill of credit for this, and then these these bills can still be recirculated. Um, but it, it's again set up so that they can be recirculated, but only in, in productive measures. So, you know, the, the the farmer who received a bill of credit for the farm, they might uh, pass that <coughs> bill of credit on to someone who sells them fertilizer, and that that would still that's what that still works. You can still, still do that. Works. Yeah. But you just can't pass it on to a uh, car dealership. Unless you need it. Unless you, yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe the tractor dealership. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I went to Lamborghini. <laughs> <laughs> they sell tractors. They sell tractors. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, it, it, it makes much more sense to actually. Um, turn that bill of credit in, into what it was intended for because then you can go from, from having uh, virtually nothing to having a farm that, that produces an income and, and, and right. food, food to sustain you starting from scratch, starting from having nothing. Now the loan is repaid to the bank and now you have a farm that's, that's producing, right? And then, and then that credit goes and gets recirculated. And um, in that way, I, I have found that... Um, Credit that uh, you, can, you can make the analogy that water is like the credit of an ecosystem because um, you know you can have you can have the idea of turning a desert into into a rainforest. Yeah. Like you need the water to come in, but if you have too much, it's a flood. If you have too little, it's a drought, and that's why dams are like the banks of an ecosystem, right? They control how much. 
a liquid water has been defined by the astronomers as the only um, material in the universe that can support life anywhere on any planet. If they don't have liquid water, life won't exist. Yeah, and they, they've, uh, they're very, very convinced that there's been water on, uh, warm, flowing water on Mars. So yes. So, but the, but the one thing about um, my analogy is it's a little bit off because um, a dam is kind of like uh, a monitor is bank. It's, it's, uh, it doesn't work as straight what happens to the water. It doesn't, doesn't say um, maybe the dam operate, operator can control where it, where it winds up, but, uh, or, or the one building the canal. But, uh, and, and that is a big difference between, between a monitor bank and a, and a, a credit offering bank or banking system is that um, in a credit system that the, you know, the person who's running the, you know, he's, he's the president of, of the, uh, you know, like a Nicholas Biddle or, or an Alexander Hamilton, these are, these are geniuses that are like composers, right? They're composing the economy. Sure. It's a planned economy. Right. Whereas, um, you know, uh, a Ben Bernanke is, is just uh, is just an animal who's, who's reacting to, to market forces and market situations. And he's finished now, apparently. I hope so. His, re his replacement is about here now. Yeah, well, he's, he's done enough, so I'm sure he needs yeah. to rest. Um, but yeah, you have sort of you know, all, all these guys do in a monetarist uh, economy is, is they react to a market situation by increasing decreasing the interest rate and it's a very passive reactionary, uh, they, you know, they, they don't really get involved in, in what's happening in the economy. It's not, it's not planned, so anything could happen based on who's, who's got all the chips, I guess, is really who decides in that scenario, right? Uh, so this kind of system works best on a national scale. Um, you know, if, if it's a na national policy that, that they make good on these debts, uh, then the debts actually become highly valuable. You can, if if uh, the U.S. government owes you money and they're, and they're actually running a system, you know, a credit system, then that debt is gold. It's gold, right? It's, it's going to increase in value just based on, on the production that it's uh, enabling, even even beyond the interest that it bears. It's very valuable. You know, you know it's going to be made good on. You don't have to, to worry about that. And there's no there's no bank run scenario like this is this is um, a system that uh, it, it goes against those those who say that you need a, a very strict reserve capital requirement, <coughs> so you can actually yeah. recirculate most of the credit that's in their, in their holdings, so they don't have a lot of reserve holdings, because it's being lent out for specific purposes. It's not, we're just going to let it out there and <coughs> hope it comes back. It sort of becomes self-sustaining. Yeah, it's being invested into specific enterprises that right. are not going to fail due to lack of funds, because the federal government can and create more funds. So if there's the will to make those things happen and and have this progress and um, you know increase of wealth, it's going to happen and they're going to make good on and it's going to continue to work. And of course, they've done away largely with reserves now anyway. Yeah, there's no there's no, there's no reserve requirements. requirements. There should be a reserve requirement, a very strict one in a monetary system because you know they're they're just taking our money and, and gambling with it, but um, it doesn't need to be so strict in a, in a credit system. So, um, get close to the end here. So you could, you could say it's, it's a Promethean versus Zeusian uh, system as well. One is sort of in the evening now. Is connecting the past to the future, and, and uh, with us as the conduit to that, you know, it's actually it's actually considering the future and how to uh, deal with that. Uh, 
Um, you want to cut through metal, are you going to do it with a laser beam, or are you going to put it put it on the beach and hope that the waves from the ocean eventually, you know? Uh, Not even something as crude as a hacksaw. No. No, that's that's focused concentrated energy. That's not when, you know. Uh, so, a, a green economy does not look anything like uh, an American system economy. Uh, really quickly, I wanted to uh, make this connection because I think it's really important. Um, can someone grab me a glass of water? Yeah. Um, so. So as I mentioned not, before, the you take uh, a chance on this. <laughs> <laughs> My germs are now your germs. All right. <laughs> I can put. I can get you some water. It's okay. Yeah. Oh, you got it. Yep. Uh, that was enough, thanks. So, I'll lend you this water, but I'll. Yeah. So the, uh, there was this turning point in the 60s of the assassination of JFK and, and his brother, and uh, it's been uncovered that that was orchestrated through uh, a company called Permadex, based in Montreal. 51% uh, owner of that is a man named uh, Louis Mortimer Bloomfield, um, who, uh, Mr. Garrison, what was his name? Boy, William, William Garrison, William Garrison uh, wrote in his book. That was sort of the uh, where everything sort of led to in his investigations, but um, they weren't able to. Well, they were stopped from from getting the, the true culprits uh, put on the stand. But uh, this this network that's connected through Permadex is also very tightly connected to the World Wildlife Fund, and um, in France, actually. There were 13 attempts on Charles de Gaulle's life, and uh, Permadex is, is not welcome in, in France and a couple other European nations because they were. Well, maybe 13 were connected to Permadex. Uh, so France and a couple other European nations um, have banned Permadex because of their connections to these assassination um, rings, or whatever you call them. And, uh, and the fact that they don't really do anything else of, of significance, they just appear to be a, a front organization for channeling money. And um, this is significant to me because uh, if you connect the dots, you can connect. Um, Bloomfield is, is a founding member of uh, the 1001 Club, which is mainly, its main purpose is, is to fund the World Wildlife Fund, which has stated that the world's carrying capacity is one billion, we need zero growth, we need to be industrialized, sovereign nations have to go, we need you know, a global institution to uh, impose these um, measures to save the earth from the cancerous scourge of mankind. And uh, other founding members who each paid ten thousand dollars to be such. Uh, founding members of the Thousand One Club were uh, Conrad Black. Um, I'm not sure if Paul Demeray himself, but uh, Power Corp and, and, and others uh, connected to him were among those. And then you have. Um, I'm trying to connect Bertrand Russell to that. I don't know if anyone has, has heard of him being like a former. World Wildlife Fund uh, member or something like that. But, uh, you have, uh, yeah, so the World Wildlife Fund was founded by Julian Huxley, uh, someone with the last name Rockefeller, uh, His Royal Highness uh, Prince Philip, wow. Bernhardt, the card carrying uh, Nazi himself, Rothschild, Satan, Hitler, <laughs> pretty much. Um, the, usual, <laughs> the usual This is Yeah, so this is pretty, uh, pretty clear. Maurice Strong. Thank you. That was another one that I would have. When was the uh, world very strong? Yeah. When, when was the World Wildlife Fund created? When? Yeah. Um, I think it was 50. That's 61. 61. 61. 
Yeah, the, this was um, one of the earliest of, of the Green Movements, but uh, you had the Sierra, Sierra Club and the CDS before that. But the World Wildlife Fund now is the, the leading environmental movement. It's the top of the room. Club of Rome, yeah, that's um, it's not as uh, it's definitely a, uh, one of the major players, but I'm not sure it's, it's quite as publicly right. I don't know enough about that. Well, the, the Club of Rome is more, more, is more the uh, oriented to just the issue of population uh, without going. But it is, they it, is part of, it is part of it. Yeah, but they don't have like commercials trying to appeal to Yeah, right. No, they're not an organ. They're not going out to the population. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're, they're an elite. They're a club of elite top people. So right now the Bank of Canada has um, a provision, you know, we, we do have a Bank of Canada, uh, and it says in, in the Bank of Canada Act that um, in some cases one third, in some cases one quarter of, uh, of the revenue should, uh, should be repaid. It, 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 it's basically a, a capital reserve requirement that um, is very restrictive, so you, you can't recirculate as much of the credit as would be necessary to do something like build a wap up and uh, you know build dams and, and uh, canals that are ten times the biggest uh, things you've seen in the world so far. So that would have to be changed so that we could we could be um, building up. In a way that's um, it, it's growing as, as fast as the universe is changing. You can't just double your energy supply. You need to, to grow by scales of magnitudes in, in how dense and uh, <coughs> quantitative your energy is. Um, so I could do the bail-in. You guys want to uh, talk about the bail-in for five or ten minutes? Or should we, do we have time to go there? Yeah? Okay. Um, okay. It's the, that's the only other thing I have except for um, a quote from Lincoln about uh, uh, the, the National Bank Act, revealing that. Should we go into the bail-in? Is it connected to what you're saying? It lives out. It's not necessary. Okay. Oh. <laughs> I wish it could lift out. Right. I wish it could lift out. But okay. Um, really quickly, yeah. So the uh, there's now that the bailouts are are less and less popular. Um, they're setting up uh, Canada, the EU, the Commonwealth, and the U.S. as bail-in regimes. Basically. Uh, the globally significant too big to fail, too big to jail banks um, would, be, would be saved by taking the unsecured deposits from uh, depositors and uh, converting them into bank stock, which of course would be worthless if the bank was ever in such a state that they needed to steal your deposits. So when they did it in Cyprus recently, uh, people got uh, $2 bank shares. They got, you know, some of them 80%, some of them. 20 or 40 percent of their deposits were converted into bank shares or just outright taken. And um, two dollar bank shares became worth one cent. And with no hope of, of increasing the value because he's going to invest in a bank that's obviously bankrupt. So that's, that's the new plan to, to basically uh, loot, loot the population. Save the gambling tax of uh, Wall Street and uh, their global counterparts. Um, Canada has it in its uh, 2013 budget um, that they released. It's a, it has the words bail in regime right in there. Uh, mm. The European Union, some of the, some of the people who govern that, uh, some, of, some of the top officials there have said that the Cyprus template is the, is the model for the EU. They're going to implement that. Um, 
in the U.S., the Dodd-Frank bill, I think it's 30,000 or 50,000 page bill that they're still writing even though it's been passed. Uh, they're still writing more pages to it. Uh, the second uh, installment of that has a, a Title II orderly liquidation authority, which um, basically puts the, uh, the derivatives and all this uh, junk as the top priority for what gets saved in, in the bankruptcy proceedings. And then, uh, you know, people's deposits are lower than that. So that's how they're going to play that out as these things. Uh, the, the globally significant. Uh, <laughs> no, it's the ones that are considered too big to fail. Uh, yeah. JP Morgan Chase, Goldman Sachs, Citibank. There's, there's 20 global banks. There's 20 global banks. Yeah. HSBC probably more. Right, and there's some, there's some U.S. Uh, there's some RBC. Royal Bank? RBC. Royal Bank of Scotland. Royal Bank of Scotland. Royal Bank of Scotland. Royal Bank of Scotland. I'm not sure if any Canadian ones are on that list. Well, HSBC is a big Canada. Yeah, I think it's the, the London based one. That's right. So that's one of the things that struck me when I come back to California. Everywhere I went, I was in these red white HSBC. Uh, so, so RBC. Pimples on an analog. Are not the, uh, are the RBC and World Bank of Scotland not related? Oh, I'm sure they're related, but. Like, closely? As in pretty much operating under really different names? Because, which is, which is actually really, uh, it's a Dutch bank, right? Yeah, well, I, I certainly wouldn't mean. Because the Royal Bank of Canada is a Dutch bank. The Dutch bank. Yeah, that's what I. That's the first thing I ever read about it. Well, mm -hmm. I, I certainly wouldn't want anyone to come away with the impression that Canada is, is immune to any of this. Or oh yeah, that, definitely not. That our, our banks are not engaging in this uh, <coughs> suicidal speculation. You think just three European Union, Canada, the Commonwealth, so Australia, oh, oh. as well as the U.S. They're all they're all bailing regimes now. So, um, so that's uh, that, and then the last thing I wanted to do was uh, this quote from Lincoln. He's trying to save the uh, the National Bank, uh, December 26, 1839. He's fighting Van Buren, who, who was uh, a protege and lawyer of Andrew Jackson, uh, on this issue, and this is his, his response. Of the sub treasury, then, as contrasted with the national bank. For the before enumerated purposes, I lay down the following propositions to wit. <coughs> First, it will injuri injuriously, injuriously. Affect, injuriously affect the community by its operation on the circulating medium. Two, it will be a more expensive fiscal agent. Three, it would be a less secure depository of the public money. To show the truth of the first position, proposition, let us take a short review of our condition under the operation of a national bank. It was the depository of the public revenues. Between the collection of those revenues and the disbursements of them by the government, the bank was permitted to and did actually loan them out to individuals, and hence the large amount of money annually collected for revenue purposes which by any other plan would have made, which have been, would have been idle a great portion of the time, was kept almost constantly in circulation. Any person who will reflect that money is only valuable while in circulation will readily perceive that any device which will keep the government revenues in constant circulation instead of being locked up in idleness is no inconsiderable advantage. By the sub-treasury, the revenue is to be collected and kept in iron boxes until the government wants it for disbursement, thus robbing the people of the use of it while the government does not itself need it, and while the money is performing no nobler office than that of rusting in iron boxes. The natural effect of this change of policy, everyone will see, is to reduce the quantity of the money in circulation. And later in this quote, he says, the amount of paper in circulation that the 40 million would serve as a basis to is withdrawn, which would be in a sound state at least 100 million, 
when 100 million or more of the circulation we have now shall be withdrawn, who can contemplate without terror the distress, ruin, bankruptcy, and vagary that must follow? Almost that. The man who has purchased, who has purchased any article, say a horse, on credit at $100, when there are 200 million circulating in the country, if the quantity be reduced to 100 million by the arrival of payday, we'll find the horse but sufficient to pay half the debt, and the other half must either be paid out of his other means, and thereby become a clear loss to him, or go unpaid and thereby become a clear loss to him. What I have here said of a single case of the purchase of a horse will, go, will hold good in every case of a debt existing at this time, a reduction in the quantity of money occurs by whomsoever and whatsoever and for whatsoever it may be, have been contracted. It may be said that, the, that what the debtor loses, the creditor gains by his operation, but on examination this will be found true only to a very limited extent. It is more generally true that all lose by it. The creditor, by losing more of his debts than he gains by the increased value of those he collects, the debtor, by either parting with more of his property to pay his debts than he received in contracting, or by entirely breaking up in his business and thereby being thrown upon the world in idleness. Okay. Very nice quote. That's it. Thank you. Um, these things could, these theories could work, but, you know, the reality is that most things we look at, such as the world or the universe or the human mind, they're, they're not closed systems. They're, they're constantly changing, and they're subject to um, self-conscious creative change. Um, they want, uh, one of the things that came out of this was the Gaia theory, you know, that, that's applying this, this idea to, to the world as a and, and considering it as an organism. Um, so this is the, the, the cybernetics of the 60s. Uh, so if everything can be reduced to equations, including the human mind, then that means that computers can replace all of those things, including the human mind. And, uh, of course, that would mean that that's the best way to ensure stability. Right? And you've got a... Uh, centuries-old decaying empire that has a uh, great vested interest in, in stability and, and status quo and making sure that things don't change, right? So, you can sort of see the parallel here. Can you guys hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What? No. <laughs> It just doesn't make sense, though. We, we would have gone extinct if, uh, if, there, if there was no change inherent in our nature. Uh, so you have the stage set for the computer utopianists of California in the 80s. Uh, they sort of believed that um, computers could free us from the, from the scourge of leadership, big ideas that sort of transcend the current reality. Um, they thought that, you know, power structures and centralization were, were the enemy, and that, uh, you know, you can, you can um, be free of these things, you know, free to pursue your, your, your own pleasures and avoid pain, I suppose, by um, creating a feedback loop, or a series of feedback loops of of, um, the human experience. So you set up so that everyone is interconnected through these computers and, and can give feedback about what they're experiencing. And, and that, you know, some algorithms that, that um, uh, you know, because that was uh, the best path to world peace, I guess. Maybe, you know, if we just annihilate everyone, then, then we'll be uh, eternally peaceful, right? Uh, 
So Tainsley's primary idea was that uh, the environment sort of existed in, a, in an equilibrium state where you have um, sort of a stasis of, uh, of these systems that are, that are sort of um, feeding into each other in, in a series of feedback loops. And it's all a closed system, of course. Um, you know, the universe is a closed system. It's entropic. Uh, there's, there's no way to increase or, or refine or um, develop your resources. You just have what you have. And, and uh, it's sort of, you know, everything's like a, a, a clock that's been wound up and is, is winding down and eventually will uh, stop. And you'll have, you know, evenly dispersed, uh, motionless matter, I guess. I suppose that's the ideal state for the uh, oligarchy. They, you know, change is bad and uh, motionlessness is good, I suppose. Um, but this whole worldview is, is incredibly flawed. You can see evidence everywhere you look. You know, life is clearly developing towards higher complexity and not winding down. That's why we have cities and, you know, language. Um, you could also look at, uh, you know, the, the, the records of, um, like fossil records. I'll show you, um, a good example is cyanobacteria, which is kind of like a blue green algae. Uh, 2.4 billion years ago, it started to, um, have its own revolution where, uh, It was using photosynthesis to eat up the, um, the, the CO2 and the, and the certain gases in the atmosphere, and it produced oxygen. And it was so successful at this, actually, that uh, you, you had a, a collapse of all these other species that were that were based on these other gases. And you had the, the um, what's it called here? It was the greatest extinction event that we know of, uh, but but that was actually followed by what's called the Cambrian Explosion, which is a huge um, evolutionary leap where many new species were formed and uh, they all had greater ability to metabolize energy in their environment, they were bigger, they could, you know, move day and night, not just when the sun was out, things like that. Uh, quite a big difference, actually, in, in the, their abilities, they had lungs, you know, their breathing air, things like this, they're, they're coming onto the land. So this kind of shows you that that life is, is um, going in a certain direction. It's not just random, right? And you don't have, um, it's not really a system of stasis, right? It's not, it's not just equilibrium and balance and staying the same. It's changing, it's evolving, it does that on its own. That's how life works. That's how the universe the universe works. But uh, these guys are, are pushing a reductionist philosophy that sort of frames the natural world as a closed, fixed system, which first works best when change least. Uh, it has very little potential for change, but this, this doesn't match with, with the world we you know, have measured from our experience. So, you know, the, the, the idea is that uh, any changes that we impose through our activity are detrimental to the environment, uh, have a negative effect, on and that we're not really capable of, of having a positive uh, effect on the environment or, or our surroundings. Um, it's a zero-sum ideology, so, you know, it's, it's, it's literally that the idea that you can take everything you see, reduce it to an equation of mathematics, balance it out on two sides of the equation, and, and uh, that's it. There's no, there's no way to really change the uh, parameters on either side, and uh, you've kind of got, uh, you know, it's balanced. So if you change anything, it throws off the balance, and, and it all goes out of whack, and, and you have a... Uh, Catastrophe, I suppose. 
So Tansley called this the great universal law of equilibrium. Um, and they wanted to apply this to everything, uh, including mechanical systems, where you know you can you can show some examples of closed systems where <laughs> so good evening. Um, I prepared a little presentation I wanted to talk about um, that I've discovered is, is somewhat of a connection between the, uh, the, the foundations of the green movement and um, what later became sort of a green economics and um, how, how that transition happened. Um, I'm going to start with a man named Sir Arthur Tinsley. Uh, in 1913, he founded the British Ecological Society, which was a time period where uh, eugenics was popular. Uh, the American movement was the biggest, but uh, it came from Britain. The Huxleys, uh, and Thomas Huxley was the grandfather of eugenics, and uh, that was, uh, it was not a dirty word at the time. People uh, believed that uh, you know, need to strengthen the gene pool by eliminating the weaker. Um, at the same time period, um, you had the Sierra Club uh, starting to surface, and they were um, trying to get involved in, in building dams in, in San Francisco, things like that. That was the sort of earliest incarnation you're going to see of the uh, green movement um, with these two things simultaneously emerging the BES and the Sierra Club. Um, the BES was, was kind of a, a, a vehicle of British imperial rule. Um, and uh, Sir Arthur Tainsley uh, was an interesting character. Craig Isherwood from uh, the, the, camp, uh, the CEC in Australia, that's uh, a LaRouche organization, he, he uh, did a report about Tamesley, uh, saying that he was not an objective scientist. Uh, he was a, a product of Britain's elite Trinity College in Cambridge. Uh, he was a Fabian socialist, a devout eugenicist, and uh, he was also the protege of a man named Bertrand Russell, who uh, Rouge knows him better than I do. He would tell you that he was the most evil man of the 20th century, uh, who once advocated to uh, nuclearly annihilate Russia before they could get the bomb, that, that read this data and give feedback themselves are going to, to govern society and how you manage the resources and stuff like that. But of course, it's, again, going to be a fixed state. It can't grow, it can't change, it can't improve. It's just going to be staying with, with the, you know, sticking with the carrying capacity that we have, which the World Wildlife Fund would, would say is a billion people, some say less. Um, or it also can be true, speaking of it doesn't work, things change. Of course, yeah. and, uh, we all have the, the power that Neo has to revolutionize it. So they did this experiment where they put um, 500, 800 people in a stadium, something like that, and they gave them all uh, paddles. One side is red, one side is green. They put them all on the, on the chair. And um, they didn't give them any instructions. They just people sat down and checked out these paddles and said, "What do these do?" And then someone held one up and saw that it correlated to something on the screen on on the uh, big screen in front of everyone. So pretty soon they all figured out that, that these things actually have an effect on what's happening there, and it's, a, it's sort of a cumulative effect. So once there's two sides of the room. One side controls the, the right side, and the other side controls the left side of the screen. It's actually the game of Pong, which is in, in the 80s, and that was the, the latest game. So you would like this. Yeah. You had uh, one side of the room versus the other, and uh, red makes the, the pound go up, and green makes it go down. So if they want to stop it, if they want to defend their goal, they actually uh, can't have everyone turn it red and go up, because then it'll go too fast and go beyond the, the thing. So some of the people had to be 
pulling it down even though clearly it has to be moving up. So, so they sort of have this balance that... Uh, being play, play they just figured it out intuitively? Or? Yeah, just somehow some of them knew that you can't have too many people doing that or go too far. So they found this, this balance where they're actually playing the game and hitting, hitting the ball back and forth being successful at doing this, and they, they claim that this proved that, you know, this whole computer utopian idea would uh, would work, and you don't need leadership, you don't need ideas to, to govern society, you can just have cooperation. You just have a giant game of yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wish that worked. <laughs> <laughs> it's analogous to it. Alright, everyone, time to vote. Turn on your Pong games. <laughs>